my talk today is going to derive much of its inspiration and content from the work of a great art historian who I heard for the first time at a fantastic conference in Assisi, uh, Father Timothy Verdin. He's an accomplished art historian and theologian. That's a rare coincidence to have those two in combination. And this particular book, which was very inspiring for me, is an excellent overview of how Mary has been depicted in the history of Western art. And um, if one is interested in the lecture series this fall, I highly commend this book uh, as something to uh, purchase. Uh, the goal of my talk this morning is going to explain this picture, which you saw last week as well. It was very important for Professor Cavadini's lecture, but part of the, I guess you would say, subtext of my talk today is the relationship of the titles, Mary, Mother of Mercy, and Mary, Mother of the Church. <clears throat> this picture of Piero della Francesca of Mary extending her cloak over a very specific group of laymen and women of his day. In order to understand this image, we need to know two basic facts. One is the setting and life of the painting itself. It's part of an altarpiece, you can see it there right in the middle, that would have been situated directly over the altar where a priest would be saying mass. I was first made aware of how important the location of a work of art was when I was given a tour of St. Peter's for a group of Notre Dame undergraduates about a decade or so ago when my son was a student here. The students at Notre Dame at least then, maybe still do now, I don't know, the students who are studying in Europe for the year meet in Rome during Holy Week. Uh, and uh, my wife and I took that opportunity to travel ourselves and we were able to enjoy a number of the tours that were set up for the Notre Dame students. One of them, a tour of St. Peter's, led by uh, also an excellent art historian, Elizabeth Lev. And what makes her such a good guide, just as Timothy Verdon is a good guide, is that she's both theologically sophisticated and has a discerning and learned eye for reading uh, Renaissance art, especially for knowing what its originating purpose was uh, prior to that trip, prior actually to going to Italy where so much of the art is in situ. You see it right where it was created, which was tremendously influential for me going for there for the first time. I was always used to looking at pieces of medieval Renaissance art either in books uh, or uh, in museums, the Chicago Institute of Art, the Louvre, wherever, but on a wall. But uh, rarely was art, certainly medieval or Renaissance art, created to be put uh, in a museum wall. It was meant for places within churches and to serve specific functions within those churches. And knowing uh, what a piece of art, what, where it was situated and why it was situated there is uh, tremendously important for understanding uh, its significance. So I can still remember standing in front of Michelangelo's famous Pietà uh, in St. Peter's and being told the significance of its placement above one of the side altars in that building. The image of Mary holding the body of her son after its removal from the cross is traditional, of course, but what makes this image so striking is that Mary is holding the body in a very unstable fashion. As Liv Lev explains it, if we could animate the statue and advance the temporal sequence just a few moments, Mary would drop the body right in front of the viewer. But where would the body then land? Well, given that the Pietà is situated immediately in front of an altar, the body would be dropped precisely where the priest is consecrating the Eucharistic host. Mary, in other words, is not simply mourning over the corpus of her son. She's offering her son to us as the sacrament of salvation. We can see a similar structural parallel in this rendering of the Mass of St. Denis. Here we see a priest elevating the sacred host above the altar. But notice, very important, he's elevating the host uh, immediately in front of an image of Mary holding uh, the baby Jesus. As Timothy Verdon noted, it's easy to associate the sacramental corpus Christi, 
that the priest holds with the baby that had been conceived in the virgin's womb. Also note this altarpiece by Filippo Lippi. I'll read Timothy Verdon's text, though, first without the subordinate clauses, only the main clause. I think it'll be clear if we read just the main clause. It's a kind of a grammar lesson. And then go back and place the subordinate clauses in their proper position. Main clause, the image places the child just above the point where the priest consecrated the bread and wine drawn from the earth. So when we look at this picture, if you're looking at it in a book, of course, you miss almost all of its significance because it's meant to be placed in an altarpiece immediately above that spot where the priest would hold the host at moment of consecration and you would compare the host uh, to the baby Jesus. You're adoring the host, Mary is adoring her son. Then the whole text of uh, Timothy Verdon. The image shows Mary as she adores her son born upon the earth. The image places the child just above the point where at the altar on which this work originally stood, the priest consecrated the bread and wine drawn from the earth. The altarpiece at San Sepulcro was clearly meant to convey a similar thought. In other words, Mary here in this altarpiece, whoops, sorry, uh, is placed over the altar and we're meant to see her in relationship to the consecration. The altarpiece at San Sepulcro that we're considering here today was clearly meant to convey a similar thought with Mary with her cope extended over uh, the uh, lay confraternity uh, exactly in the position where we saw in these other images um, where uh, uh, Mary is um, uh, on the altar presenting the baby and the relationship to the Eucharistic host. And here, What makes this depiction unique and somewhat surprising is that Mary does not present the viewer here with the expected image of her son, which we saw in this Friedrico Lippi, the mass of St. Denis, where the son is associated with Mary, and there's an immediate identification of the son with the body we'll receive at the Eucharist. What makes this image surprising is that we don't have Mary with her son, but we have Mary with these members of a lay confraternity. And I'm going to devote the rest of my time this afternoon trying to explain why Piero della Francesca has placed these lay members of a confraternity in the place where we would expect uh, the baby Jesus. So let me uh, provide some background to this picture. As we've seen, it's part of an altarpiece commissioned by the Confraternity of Divine Mercy in San Sepulcro, 1445, for the group's oratory. It's sometimes labeled, as John Cavadini mentioned last week, uh, La, La Madonna della Misericordia, Our Lady of Mercy. Uh, the altar place piece has three horizontal layers, which you can see here, the pinnacle and the predella at the bottom, and then the middle layer that we're going to attend to. Um, and we have images here um, that are most appropriate to the altar upon which the sacrifice of Christ will be represented. At the center of the pinnacle pad panel, uh, we see the crucifixion with Mary and John flanking Jesus. On either side of the crucifixion is a depiction of the Annunciation, the Archangel Gabriel and Mary hearing the words of the angel. This scene is particularly apt for an altarpiece because it depicts the moment that Christ became enfleshed within Mary's womb. And it is this body that will die for us men and for our salvation on the cross. And it is this body that was offered to us on the altar during the sacrifice of the mass. On either side of the Annunciation, we find St. Benedict and St. Francis. In the center of the predella panel, the panel here at the bottom, we have the entombment uh, of Christ, that is the laying out of Christ's body just prior to its being laid in the tomb. This makes it clear that the focus of the entire tableau is on the body of Christ offered on our behalf a body that was conceived at the Annunciation, offered on our behalf at the Passion, and eventually offered anew on the altar that this piece stood upon. Flanking the atonement scene at the bottom are scenes from uh, Holy Week. Won't go into those. 
Uh, Timothy Verdon, in commenting upon this image, makes an important observation about the central axis. Here we've looked at it horizontally. Now we're going to look at the central axis here of the painting and the relationship to the altar upon which it sits. He writes this, in traditional Christian belief, the mass makes Christ's death on the cross present in an unbloody manner. And in medieval liturgical theory, the rectangular central part of the altar between the base and the tabletop was called the tumba, or tomb. That is to say, the altar upon which the bread was placed was understood to symbolize the tomb in which Christ's body was laid. Thus, the image of the crucifixion above and the entombment below uh, were standard Eucharistic allusions, easily decipherable in the context of the Mass. And in a town whose very name, San Sepulcro, meaning Holy Sepulcher, alludes to the mystery of Christ's death and burial, this standard imagery had additional impact. The altarpiece has this name because the individuals gathered under her cloak are part of a confraternity dedicated to the works of mercy as itemized in Matthew 25. Perhaps you all are familiar with that text in which at the last judgment the sheep will be separated from the goats. Uh, the sheep who will be invited into uh, heaven will be those who fed Christ when he was hungry, gave him water when he was thirsty, etc. Uh, the individuals so invited to the beatific vision are surprised. They ask Christ, when did we ever do those things for you? Uh, and he responds, when uh, <clears throat> ever you fed a poor person, gave uh, water to a thirsty person, visited someone in prison, you did that for me. Very important text from Matthew and influenced and inspired these confraternities in the medieval period. For example, we can consider this fresco from a Florentine confraternity. The work is attributed to the circle of Bernardo Dadi and dates from around 1340. It was funded by the Campagna de Santa Maria della Misericordia, founded in 1244 by St. Peter of Verona. And one scholar writing about this image writes, the artist depicts here Mary dressed in a magnificent cope. The merciful character of the painting is depicted in these circular medallions on the cope, which have the beatitudes inscribed within them. Well, here we can see the Madonna of Mercy with the uh, individuals of the lay confraternity gathered around. And then these words, which are hard to read, but they're Latin or Italian uh, from Matthew 25, uh, basically are a summary of the words of Matthew 25. One reads, visito, I visit those in mercy, tego, I cover the naked, poto, I give drink to the thirsty, and so forth. Thus, the Madonna declares in the name of the confraternity of this city that she carries out charitable works of mercy. You can also compare this image of Simona Martini, dated to 1310 and found in Siena. All three of these images, and I wanted to show all three of them because this is a conventional image, conventional image associated with Mary, Mother of Mercy. All of these images funded by the confraternities who understood themselves to be inspired by her merciful character. Uh, and these are images which then inspired, of course, Piero della Francesca. That picture of Mary with her cope is not original to him. It's traditional. But what makes his painting unique is his placement of this image within an altarpiece, which we're going to get to in a moment. But before getting there, let me say a couple of words about this important association I've mentioned several times without defining. That is a confraternity. What is a confraternity? A proper answer to this question requires a little historical background. First of all, it's very important to realize that the distribution of goods to the poor changes dramatically when we come to the early modern period, basically 1600 forward. At that point in time, charitable activities move from the church to civic organizations as they are located in our own day. But in the period in which we're considering, the period out of which 
these incredible works of art uh, are inspired is a period in which charitable action occurs only and solely through the church. And confraternities, organizations of lay people and clergy were the means by which goods to the poor uh, were delivered. Poor houses, soup kitchens, orphanages, and hospitals were run by these lay confraternities. We can say that Christian life in the medieval period was defined by one's liturgical obligations, going to mass, and one's social obligations, direct service to the poor through these lay confraternities. Serving the poor in this period wasn't optional, uh, nor was it occasional and sporadic. It was organized. Think of these paintings. These were funded by confraternities trying to give voice and vision, visual expression, to the significance of this within the religious life of the church. Charity in our day often has a bad name. People tend to think of the act of charity as putting a few coins into a Salvation Army bucket at Christmas or Easter. Charity on this view, at least for many cultural critics, is a, ba a band-aid meant to cover over gross inequities in the distribution of wealth within a given Western culture. But before 1600, charity certainly didn't operate this way. The distribution of goods and services to the poor in this period was highly developed, structural part of the church. Confraternities were organized and devoted to assessing the needs of a community and putting in place institutions that address them. The altarpiece is a testimony to this fact. These men and women gathered under the cloak of Mary are part of a highly organized lay sodality. They are at the visual center of this work of art because the work they carried out was central to the meaning of the gospel. I find these images are incredible. I hope I do justice to explaining them in this lecture, but you, you view them. You, it's not just art, but you see the way in which the Christian life was understood uh, and lived out. It's really, at least for me, incredible, inspiring, and humbling at the same time. So let me return to the question I initially posed. What's striking about Piero's altarpiece, we noted, is the placement of this conventional image of Mary. Here is where the theme of Mary, Mother of Mercy, is going to make its important transition to Mary as Mother of the Church. And here is where your handout is quite useful, which is a long text from uh, Timothy Verdon, which I could have read out loud, but I think it wouldn't penetrate as deeply in oral words as seeing it written and having it there in front of you. Here's what he writes. Let me get the image here in mind. In Piero's altarpiece, the members of the confraternity have been positioned in such a way to make explicit their identity as the body of Christ, limbs of one organi organism, the community of believers, that is the church. Here we go, this is mother of mercy, or is it mother of the church? Um, if they are, uh, that is the church, its members compassionately concerned for others. And if they are collectively the body of Christ, then they have an intimate relationship with Mary, since, as noted, the body of Christ comes from Mary's body. That's what we saw in those other altar pieces, Filippo Lippi, or that mass of St. Dennis, where we have uh, the baby Jesus held by Mary in front of the altar. But the church is also the body of Christ, right? Coming forth from Mary. And that's clearly what inspires Piero della Francesca to insert this image. And what we might have gathered is an unexpected uh, location. And Verdun is very much attuned to this. Uh, they are collectively the body of Christ. They have an intimate relationship with Mary. The body of Christ comes from Mary's body. As members of the church, they're children of Mary, traditionally considered to be the Mater Ecclesia, or the Mater Christianorum, the mother of the church or mother of Christians. 
She became the mother of all believers at the moment illustrated in the crucifixion there at the top, placed above the central panel of this altarpiece, when from the cross where he hung, quoting here John 19, those of you who are last week will remember this from Professor Cavadini's talk, Jesus saw Mary with the disciple whom he loved standing beside her. He said to her, Mother, there is your son, and to the disciple, there is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple took her into his home. Mary thus prefigures the church, which similarly gives birth to Christ and its members. The church, like Mary, possesses perpetual integrity and uncorrupt fecundity, says St. Augustine, and that which Mary merited in her flesh, the church preserves in her mind, with the difference that Mary bore only one son while the church bears many children, destined to be united in one through the one who is Christ. A medieval theologian, Blessed Isaac of Stella, similarly insists that Mary and the church both, quote, conceived by the Holy Spirit and without carnal desire and both give the Father sons free from sin. In Blessed Isaac's view, Christ is, quote, the firstborn among many brethren, one by nature, through grace he has associated many with himself so that they might be one with him. In Piero's painting, the Misericordia members are presented as sons and daughters of the church, associated with the firstborn son, Christ, through Eucharistic sharing in his body and blood, and in Isaac Stella's phrase, one with him. Their expression of awe and adoration here, uh, that is, uh, these lay members of our confraternity gazing up uh, at Mary, uh, suggests a dawning awareness of the dignity God has conferred on them. What St. Paul calls the illumination of believers' inward eyes so that they may grasp the hope to which God calls them. Uh, they gaze with love at Mother Church, for it is from her that they receive Christ, and in her they become Christ. Mary herself, the church, dis dis uh, displays a joyful inwardness that is anything but impersonal or impassive. Piero indeed contrasts her joy in the main panel with the grief Mary expresses in the crucifixion, which would be just above this image. This noble figure gathering her children to herself might be mentally reciting the canticle spoken shortly after she conceived Christ. Here from the Magnificat, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Rejoice my spirit in God my Savior. His name is holy, his mercy sure from generation to generation for those who fear him. Piero, in fact, shows her here conceiving other children who manifest, quote, God's mercy from generation to generation. Before concluding, I'd like to return to the relationship of our altarpiece to a theology of the Eucharist. Let me begin by recalling a key sentence from the handout we just read, uh, one, two, third paragraph, the very last sentence there, which reads, they, meaning the members of our confraternity there gathered below Mary's cope, gaze with love at Mother Church, for it is from her that they receive Christ, and in her that they become Christ. I'd like to focus on now is that paradoxical idea of both receiving and becoming Christ. In order to get a handle on this problem, I'd like to use the writings of Father Renero Cantalamesa. He's a Capuchin priest, and since 1980, when appointed by St. John Paul II, he has served as the preacher of the papal household. That is, he's charged with preaching to the Pope and his circle during the Fridays of Advent and Lent. In his book on the Eucharist, he noted that early on in his priesthood, he, quoting here Father Cantalamesa, he used to live the moment of consecration at Mass by closing my eyes, these are his words, bowing my head and trying to estrange myself from everything around me 
and identify myself with Jesus, who before his death uttered these words in the Seneca, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. But one day, in a kind of epiphany, Father Cantalamesa realized that this historical Jesus, whom he was trying to imaginatively place himself uh, in his uh, shoes, no longer exists. Continuing the quotation of Father Cantalamesa, the risen Christ exists now, the Jesus who is dead but now lives forevermore. And this Jesus is the, important term, total Christ, totus Christi in Latin, very famous statement from St. Augustine, or, or idea that drives from St. Paul but developed uh, fully by St. Augustine. This Jesus is the total Christ. What does he mean by that? Head and body united. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 refers to the body of Christ as one body with many limbs. And then in Ephesians glosses that with Christ as the head and uh, the rest of us as the body. One body. Jesus is the total Christ united with us. So if this to it's the total Christ that says the words of consecration, then I too say those words with him. Within the great eye of the head, the small eye of the body, which is the church, is hidden. Thus, when Father Cantalamesa says the words of consecration, the subject isn't only Jesus, but the entire church of God. Continuing here with the words of Father Cantalamesa. Later, some words of St. Augustine removed all doubt about this intuition, making me realize that it is the soundest of traditional doctrine even if much attention is no longer paid to it. And here is the last paragraph from your handout from Father Cantalamesa, here citing at least initially St. Augustine, who writes, the whole redeemed city, that is the congregation of the saints, is offered to God as a universal sacrifice through the mediation of the high priest who offered himself for us in the form of a servant so that we might become the body of so great a head. The church celebrates this mystery in the sacraments of the altar, well known to the faithful, where the church offers herself through what is being offered. Therefore, the church in the Eucharist offers and is offered. Remember that quote from Timothy Verdon, uh, gaze, gaze at Mother Church, for it is from her they receive Christ, and become Christ. Uh, the church offered herself through what is being offered. Therefore, the church offers and is offered at the same time in each of her members. We cannot uh, separate and divide the two things as if the priest was offering and the rest of the church laity was being offered. Each member of the church is simultaneously priest and victim. This double offering at the Mass is nicely reflected in the Eucharistic prayer three, the most common uh, Eucharistic prayer used in the Roman Catholic Mass. Here at the beginning of this Eucharistic prayer, the words of consecration are the first epiclesis or invocation of the Holy Spirit. The priest says, therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought for your consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In that prayer, uh, the Holy Spirit is invoked twice. We have the first one here to transform the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. But then a second time, the Holy Spirit is invoked. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church, recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, nourished by the body and blood, filled with the Holy Spirit, may become one body, there's our totus Christus, one spirit in Christ, may he make of us an eternal offering to you. Um, Canto La Mesa concludes by saying this, we now know how the Eucharist makes the church. The Eucharist makes the church by making the church itself Eucharist. Christians cannot limit themselves to celebrating the Eucharist. They must be Eucharist with Jesus. Okay, now maybe we have answered the question I put at the beginning 
of my talk of why is it that Piero della Francesca puts this image in his altar place where we would have expected Mary to be holding the baby Jesus. Why is she holding not the baby Jesus, but she has her cope extended over these members of the church? Um, what struck our attention was the fact that this image has displaced the expected image of Mary holding the baby Jesus. This was the expected image because it put the Corpus Christi directly in front of the bread and wine raised by the priest during the celebration of the Mass. How could a confraternal organization be worthy of displacing our Lord and Savior? Timothy Verdon helped us to see the deeper theological logic here. For the church itself, as St. Augustine knew so well, is part of the whole Christ. As Verdon put it, the members of this confraternity gaze with love at Mother Church because it's from her they both receive and become Christ. And the Eucharistic prayer itself, as we saw with the help of Father Canto La Mesa, gives testimony to this by twice invoking the work of the Holy Spirit. First, to transform the bread into the body and blood of Christ, and subsequently to make us one body with Christ in his sacrifice. I try to explain this in my foundations class with something I learned from piano teacher when I was taking piano lessons back in Boston. I happened to be good, or at least my piano teacher thought I was good. She might have been saying that to humor me to keep me uh, taking lessons uh, at playing waltzes. And so when you initially play a waltz, if any of you have taken piano, you know they're in three with accent on the first you know, beat. One, two, three, one, two, three. Well, once you get that under your fingers, my teacher said, once you've really mastered the piece, you have to move from counting in three to counting it and feeling it in one. Uh, and I like to think of the sacrifice of the Mass that way as well. We initially see these separate pieces, the offering of Christ on our behalf, but the sacrifice also involves us being pulled into the vortex of that offering, of offering ourselves as well. They are discrete elements within the sacrifice of the Mass, as the three beats and a waltz are, uh, but the profoundest playing of a waltz, of course, is eventually going to feel it in one, and I think the profoundest hearing of the Mass is also going to hear it as one as well. And I think that's also very nicely illustrated in this work of art, where we see this surprising choice by Piero della Francesca to replace the baby Jesus beside Mary with these members of the confraternity. May God Almighty, our helper and protector, give us the grace that we too may be made worthy of such a vocation. Amen. <laughs>